thank you so much for joining us. Today is Wednesday, March 13th, 2019. And I'm Melissa Rao. I'm the Senior Program Director for Leadership here at Episcopal Church Foundation. And I'm thrilled to be uh, to have Phyllis Jones from the Diocese of New Jersey with us. She was uh, has been serving as the Chief Financial Officer since I think 2010. Is that right, Phyllis? That's right. And then has been recently in 2017 was doing so much and was being so successful in her role as CFO. She was made C, uh, Chief Operating Officer, COO in 2017. So I met Phyllis just a couple months back at something called the Diocesan Leadership Initiative that Episcopal Church Foundation hosted. And she just knocked her socks off. And so we're really thrilled to have her with us. She's been writing a little bit about uh, mission-based budgeting, and she's going to review some of the stuff for us. Um, just a little um, housekeeping notes. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to drop them into the chat box, which should be on your lower ribbon. Uh, I will be fielding both comments and questions along the way. And so um, thanks so much for joining us. Phyllis, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. And I'd also like to offer my thanks in return um, to both you and to Kate Adams, who I really enjoyed talking with so much when we were at that uh, Diocesan Leadership Initiative retreat. And, you know, just to really say that I just uh, benefit so often from the things that the Episcopal Church Foundation offers through vital practices and vestry papers as far as helping with our congregations and the things they deal with. So I just wanted to, to do a little thank you in return. Um, and also to Kirsten, who's behind the scenes there, kind of getting us uh, set up. So right. Well, thank you for that shout out. <laughs> All right. So good, good afternoon. I almost said good morning. Wow. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really glad to have the chance to be with you today. Um, and uh, for this conversation about mission-based budgeting, uh, which I do very much consider to be an exploration in discipleship. Um, discipleship has been a huge focus here in the Diocese of New Jersey, as you'll see in a little while uh, from some of the materials that are here. Um, so just to kind of give you the lay of the land, um, we're going to go through the, this in basically three parts. Um, and the first part will be pretty much the why. Uh, why would we do mission-based budgeting? Um, you know, why would we, we make the effort to, to do this kind of um, a different kind of a presentation? Uh, the second part would be uh, just a real brief, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a primer on narrative budgets versus mission-based budgets, uh, just to make sure that we've got some clarity around what it is that we're doing and why they're different. Um, and then we'll get into the real meat and potatoes of the how um, based on the example of, of what we did here in the Diocese of New Jersey. Um, and in between each one of those three segments, there will be a time for us to uh, answer any questions or, or share any comments that you have. Um, so as uh, Melissa had said, as we're going through, if you can uh, just put those things into the chat box, then she'll be uh, all ready um, once we get to the breaking point to, um, uh, to be able to go through those. So. Having said that, we will launch into why mission-based budgeting. Um, and the main reason uh, that we discovered here in the Diocese of New Jersey around the why of mission-based budgeting is all about changing the conversation. Um, we talked very early on about the concept of resourcing mission um, versus just looking at a, at a, as, at a budget um, as just a drain on expenses or a drain on, um, on revenue. Um, but then we really got, as we actually got into the practice of mission-based budgeting and discovered how much it changes the conversation, um, the conversation itself actually uh, became just as important, um, if not perhaps even more so than the, the actual outcome. So that's what we had discovered here. So this was a statement um, that I had made in one of the articles that I wrote, and I very much believe, um, uh, and I think it really will, um, uh, will resonate with those of you who present budget documents, um, is that there are, especially in vestry meetings and diocesan council meetings, there are a few documents that get more attention than the budget does. And every single time we review that document, we do have an opportunity to bring ourselves back to our own articulation of uh, our understanding of God's call to us 
and how we are responding. And, you know, literally to reflect on how we put our money where our mouth is or not. So when we talk about changing the conversation, we want to talk about changing the way that we think and talk uh, about money. Um, you may recall that it's often said that the only thing that Jesus talked about more in the Bible than money was when he told us, do not be afraid. So what do we do in response? We typically run around fearful and anxious because we feel like we don't have enough. <laughs> um, and we need to change that conversation uh, to a conversation around abundance. We start really with a fundamental, basic uh, understanding of the difference between an investment and an expense. Um, and I think inherently, probably most of us who are joining today have an idea of what that is. Um, but when we really think about it and its impact on how we talk about our budgets, that's really where I think a lot of times maybe we don't uh, live into what we really inherently understand and we don't tend to look at our budgets as investments. So an investment is something that is going to start paying you back. It's expected. There's an expectation there when you're making an investment that you are going to get a return on that investment versus with an expense, it's considered just to be a drain on the resources. You know, the money came in, it went out, and we don't really know what we got out of that. We don't really know, you know, we're not expecting anything to come back. And the problem is we usually take a look at our budgets as that drain on the resources. So here is our pretty much standard um, diocesan budget. Um, and you can see that right up at the top, I'm sure this is all very familiar to, to you. You've got your revenues listed up at the top. And then down below and on the subsequent pages, we list everything that drains the revenue. And when we take a look at a budget in this kind of a context, there's not a lot of room for anything else except that conversation. Here's what's coming in. Is it what we expected? We hope it is. If we're not getting what we expected, what's that all about? You know, and then here's all the things that we are, you know, that we are spending, spending our money on rather than investing our money into. Um, and then we have the, the typical conversation about, is that over or under? Um, and then, you know, the focus here, obviously when we're looking at something like this is always on money. It's not even about what the investment of this money is doing in terms of other kinds of resources like people that kind of stuff doesn't even have an opportunity to come into a conversation like this. Um, and so that's really where, you know, while there is, um, uh, you know, the, the resources that we have there, they are often perceived as limited uh, and shrinking in many cases. So that starts us off with this, this conversation around scarcity rather than abundance. Um, it's most often expense focused, you know, we spend a little bit of time on the revenue and are we getting in what we need or not, but it's most often expense focused. The costs are, are perceived as a drain on the resources and the questions that we tend to ask ourselves are, do we still have enough? And how fast are we draining what we have? And then obviously, where are we over or under budget? So we can make sure that we don't exceed the amount we've said we were going to spend. The conversations here are often characterized by a philosophy of scarcity, and they're generally accompanied by anxiety, especially when the budgets are being developed. And last but not least, I do want to note that they do have applicability to fiduciary responsibility in our culture. So people don't walk away from our webinar today saying, oh, I heard the CFO from the Diocese of New Jersey say that conventional budgets are garbage. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying here. Um, we do have to have, you know, that accountability and that level of um, assurance that we are sticking with our plan. You know, this was what we planned to do um, and that we are sticking with our plan. So the conventional budget presentation is often uh, a good way to be able to have that. But it's all about what leads in the conversation. There really isn't the kind of life that we're looking for. Um, in, a con in the conversation around conventional budgets. So we want to change that conversation, as I, as I mentioned. And, you know, this statement that you're reading in front of you on the screen right now 
is something that people in the business world would accept without a question. Um, it just makes common sense that if you're starting a business and all you, your main goal in your business is just to survive, then you're not thinking beyond that. You know, you've kind of built the walls around your, your own frame of mind. And that, as it says here, sabotages um, ability to make sound strategic decisions. It also sabotages creativity. Um, and so, you know, the chances that you're going to be able to actually grow and sustain the business um, go down. So as I said, you know, this is something that we unquestionably accept in the business world. However, we don't seem to translate it to our, our, our work when it comes to churches. Um, it's not quite as, as upfront there. And so I decided I'd play around with this a little bit and see if I was going to flip this statement to a church context. Here's what I came up with. Those who guide a church wanting only to survive, and how often do we find ourselves or others in the position of feeling pressure to do that, are sabotaging their ability to allow the Holy Spirit to inspire them to follow Jesus Christ on God's mission of reconciliation in the world in ways that will grow and sustain their churches. So hopefully we can change the conversation so that this statement makes just as much sense in our context with vestries, councils, committees, whoever we're talking with, as the other makes in the business world. This missional mindset is not new. It's something that's been around for a long time. Um, one of my favorite references within um, the missional mindset world is Reggie McNeil, who wrote this book called Missional Renaissance. And he talks about three basic shifts that we have to make in our thinking from uh, coming out of this, you know, uh, into this, I guess, post Christendom uh, world that we live in today. Um, the first one is changing from an internal to an external ministry focus. And again, as I'm going through this stuff, I always take this back to how this impacts budget presentations. So I want you to kind of try to be thinking along the same lines as well. Um, with the budget presentations that you go through. So when we had, as you saw from you know, the, the brief example of the first page of our diocesan budget, we had a whole bunch of listings of ministries there. You know? And so for us to, rather than looking at those things as things that are just things that we do, um, we have to begin to talk about them as how did they respond to our understanding of God's call to us to move out and join in the work that he's doing in the communities all across the diocese of New Jersey. So it's not just about this doing, doing, doing. Here we've had this ministry and we always did that. You know, so now we need to be thinking about what is it that God is out there in the diocese of New Jersey calling us to do, calling our congregations to do, and how do we resource them to be doing that within their communities. So that's a little bit about the internal to external ministry focus. The second one is from program development to people development. So again, rather than saying, here we are in the Diocese of New Jersey and here's what we do, boom, 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 um, or to, to flip it into a congregational context, well, here we are at St. Swithin's and St. Swithin's does this, 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 and this, and we would love to have you, you know, come join us and do that. Instead of saying, well, thank you so much. We're so glad to see you at St. Swithin's this week. Can you tell me a little bit about what your passions are, what really turns you on, and you know, how you see yourself as connecting with you know, God's needs in the community, and asking people those questions so that we can then help them with their own development of passions that will help us connect further out into the community. So again, it's not just about these programs, these things that we do, it's about the people that we meet, the relationships that we build, and the natural growth and movement of the Holy Spirit that comes out of those encounters to help guide us. And then last but not least, far from least, is from church-based to kingdom-based leadership. And I can think of no better example of kingdom-based leadership than our own presiding bishop, Michael Curry, and the way that he has uh, led us um, through the concepts of the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, following the way of Jesus, 
um, loving, liber liberating, and life-giving ministries, and now into the way of love practices for a Jesus-centered life. This is not looking at the, the even the Episcopal Church on that level as an institution that needs to be preserved. This is looking at what the Episcopal Church, through its networks and connections and relationships, has the power to put out into our community in so many different ways um, that again, it allows the Holy Spirit to come into the to conversation and it allows God to be the one who's really directing the work and bringing the results. So that's, you know, again, just kind of a, a brief, um, you know, uh, uh, talk about missional mindset as it relates to now going into our budgets so that we can figure out how we then uh, resource uh, that missional work. Um, this was one uh, quote that I recently came across um, from the Good Book Club. Um, we just had the readings on Romans, which I thought was absolutely spot on for what I was talking about in here, uh, talking about being freed from the measures of success of this world and that our metrics for leadership and growth are not the metrics of this world, rather they are those of God's kingdom, which then raises for me that issue. Okay, so how do we take a look at those metrics? How do we communicate those metrics in ways that are probably more story and uh, story oriented than they are numbers oriented? And how do we incorporate that into the stories that we tell? And uh, the Doing the Math of Mission is the title of another one of my very favorite books uh, by Gil Rendell. This is so dog-eared at this point on my desk that I think it's about time for me to get a new copy. Uh, but this is one of my favorite quotes from that book. Um, and again, it takes literally takes what we're doing in resourcing mission right back to the concept of discipleship. Um, because it talks about disciples being made in congregations where the body of Christ invites, challenges, models, mentors, and provides accountability. And, um, you know, again, just kind of going back to that metrics conversation um, that we really need to, to be able to have. So again, wrapping up a little bit on our, our mission-based budget conversation. Um, we start with a mission-based budget from the understanding that costs are investments in God's mission of reconciliation in the world. However, we recognize, express, and join in with that. Um, we're reminded in the conversation that we already have a powerful working partner who literally invested his son's life into this mission. Um, and I love that statement. The cross is the ultimate evidence that there is no length the love of God will refuse to go in, effective, in effecting reconciliation. He's our partner. That's, God is our partner in this enterprise. And this gives us an uh, opportunity to constantly recognize that and invite the Holy Spirit into the conversation. And he is far more capable of we are, than we are of multiplying the return on our investment in helping him far beyond any capacity that we ourselves have. So I'd like to stop there for a moment and just um, uh, entertain any questions or comments. Okay, we don't have any yet, yet um, <clears throat> so far, Phyllis, and you're on a roll, so I don't even want to interject a question of my own. <laughs> I've got some burning, but I feel like it's probably going to be more appropriate a little bit further down the road. Sure, no problem. Um, I will then uh, continue on with, again, just a, a real kind of a brief, um, uh, not sure why this is not advancing. There we go. guess it just had to wake up. Um, so just a, a real brief uh, um, uh, dive into narrative budget, budgeting versus mission-based budgeting, because um, as I've understood from the past, most folks have heard of narrative budgeting. This is not a surprise. And some of them say, well, wait, what's the difference? Um, and so uh, it's really just kind of a question of how deep that dive goes um, into um, the, the understanding and the narrative behind uh, the numbers 
and where whether or not you're using what you you know what you want to come out with at, at the end of this as a presentation is this something that's kind of going to go in the annual report and be read out at the annual meeting and then never happen again or again is this something that you're really interested in incorporating into consistent conversation um, and so you can kind of see on the continuum here um, four different types that I've identified and this is just from my own experience um, uh, just kind of taking a look at the different uh, the different things I've seen from some of our congregations some other congregations and you know just in the course of my travels um, we start all the way on the left with a conventional budget with narrative support um, which really basically is just that conventional budget format that I showed you at the very beginning um, uh, as an example from the Diocese of New Jersey with perhaps some narrative that's not necessarily you know so much linked to parts of the budget as it is just a general more general explanation of what we're doing in the different areas um, you know that we that we're getting involved in so that one is pretty simple and straightforward the narrative budget then with a conventional support starts from something that looks like this and this again is just an example that I picked up where what we see now is that this particular example cites a, a, a congregation that has at least gone as far as taking the different things that they do and putting them into four buckets, um, uh, worshiping, learning, caring, and reaching out. And then they have you know, gone a little bit further um, to talk about what these things mean. Um, and I'm sure if I had the flip side of this little brochure, you'd see worshiping and learning first, but now we see the practice of caring, which is one of their buckets. And they talk about what that means um, and some of the things that they're doing that are part of that practice and they do say that part of our $192,900 budget supports this, but they don't really go too much further than that. It's really, again, just um, they're leading in with this and it's really supported with a conventional budget um, that then would go through the line items pretty much uh, in the same order, um, you know, or in the same kind of a way that you saw the ones from the diocese presented. Um, and then, you know, they have also the same thing with the practice of reaching out. A bit of a description what it is but not necessarily anything that um, indicates uh, a link between um, the expenses in the budget and uh, the, the narrative. So then the next example we have is a narrative with a summary cost allocation and the components that we have here some of them are very similar you can see that there is the explanation component um, and there is um, a little bit more detail uh, about um, uh, the actual examples of things that are being done. Um, but then in this case, you can see also down at the bottom, there's been an effort made to actually allocate the portion of the budget that is a part of this bucket for this particular church. Um, and that indicates behind the scenes that there's been some conversation about the different types of expenses included in the conventional budget and how they would translate themselves into something like this. And again, bearing in mind that a lot of times it's the conversation um, that is one of the most beneficial parts about this whole process. So then we move on to what I call an actual mission-based budget. And this is an example from the one that we put together here for the Diocese of New Jersey, um, where we organized ourselves around the five marks of mission. So you can see down at the bottom, you've got proclaiming the good news to the kingdom. This is mark number one. And rather than doing just a narrative, we did a, a more of a graphic that showed some of the things that we are doing all across, you know, to promote across our diocese that have to do with proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. But then we also have this part, which is literally taking that conventional line item budget and flipping it around to the point where we have the different groupings that you see in front of you. We've allocated the budget amongst those groupings, but then we also allocate our actual expenses right along with the um, allocation uh, proportions in the budget so that this can then become a document that our diocesan council can look at every single month mm. and, and see 
you know, if we lead with this, and then we also, as I mentioned, we always have the conventional budget because there are people who need to see that. There are times we all need to refer to that. But when this becomes your lead document and you're talking about how these particular expenses are relating to these particular um, things that are being done and you open up the conversation about, you know, it's more predominantly about these things that are in front of us and are they good things to continue doing? Are they actually helping us live into our mission and ministry? Um, and, you know, really, again, if this is what we're saying we're about, how are we putting our money where our mouth is? Um, that's the difference. And this can then become something that is a working document that, ha that takes advantage of every single one of those times that we're reviewing the budget to be putting this stuff out in front as, as really primary um, and injects a whole new level of life into the conversation. Huh. So that's basically the you know, quick and dirty on the differences. Um, and again, I would just open it up if there are any questions or comments. I have a comment and feel free, anybody remember that chat function? If you'd like to ask a question, feel free to type something in there and I'll field them to Phyllis. Mm -hmm. But Phyllis, you know, one thing that has impressed me so far is the presentation itself. I am not a money, I'm not a, a numbers person. I don't get inspired by a spreadsheet or a financial statement, but I am inspired by your very presentation. And I'm just curious, it's just a logistic question. Did you do this or did you do it in partnership with say your communications person at the diocese? Who, um, who did this? this? The presentation itself was one that I developed. Um, with uh, all yeah. the graphics and everything. Yeah, and so wow. what I did, <laughs> <laughs> what I did, and I'll back up a little bit here. So, um, as I, I I mentioned to you guys when we were you know preparing for this, um, I also use Prezi as a presentation software. Mm -hmm. This is actually one of the Prezi graphics. And so what happens in Prezi is in each one of these little circles, you would have an opportunity to put something in there, and when you go through the presentation, it kind of bounces from place to place and zooms in and out and gives you all kinds of wonderful things uh, that you can do. But then at the end of it, it has this slide where everything that you've put into the Prezi presentation is all there. And so when I thought about, I, cause I, again, I am not a graphic designer, you know, I, I need some help there. So I, they have so many different presentations at this point in time that you know, I always go back through their themes to find different things. And you'll see some of them a little bit later on when I, when I go through all of the different, uh, the, the different parts. That's super helpful. I was just thinking, I'm like, gosh, what a talented person. But you're right. There's a really great tool out there and there's a tool for everybody. So you don't necessarily have to be very creative to make something that looks awesome and people want to watch, you know, people actually want to see. Um, and so I just, I feel like that's a great, a great approach. Let's Thank you. see. Okay. Um, someone's asking, will the presentation be available for us to share with our vestry? The answer is absolutely yes. We're going to have this entire presentation uh, recorded and posted on online. You can get that from Facebook or you can email us. And Kate Adams, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Kate is, but she is a talented person. Yes, yes, she is, Kate. <laughs> we do know that. And it shouldn't feel like someone has to feel um, that they can't do this too. Right. And I do appreciate you bringing that up, Melissa, because I know that a lot of times, you know, looking at something like that, I remember the, the initial inspiration that I got for that idea came not surprisingly from an ECF um, uh, vestry papers article hmm. um, where they talked about um, it was one of the churches out in California, one of the big churches out in California, um, who did a present a graphic presentation like this, and there were samples of it up there. And I thought, wow, you know, this is really cool. I wish I could do that. There you you know, but I mean, again, this is a church that has like you know, I don't know, sixteen hundred average Sunday attendance, right? Wow. So, um, you know, uh, considerably more resources to put into communications than, you know, than I do at this point in time. Uh, but then when, again, at the same time, I had been doing these presentations in Prezi. Um, and so I thought, hmm, you know, I wonder how that would work. And praise God it did. And I will tell you also that these graphics 
um, because of the quality that Prezi has in them. I have blown this up to a 24 by 36 poster with, um, you know, for our conventions with really, really great clarity. Um, so, awesome. Great. Yeah, it's, and then, and then hopefully, you know, also if you do have somebody who's really into graphic arts or, you know, uh, something like that, that can also be a person who, who would be a good resource for you. Thank you so much. All right. That's it for now. All right. Well then into the meat and potatoes we go. Um, how do I do this? Um, and so I, you know, really kind of identified a basic six part process um, that as I reflected back on how we did this, um, you know, that seemed to make sense to me. So you can see there that we start with articulating mission, um, cho then choosing a framework, choosing categories, allocating ministries, allocating costs, and then developing the narrative. And then repeat, uh, which is the good part, because again, this, I want, you know, folks to really kind of walk away from this understanding that the beauty of it, one of the real beauties of it, um, uh, is that it is an iterative, ongoing process. It's not static. You know, you just, you don't just sort of develop this, throw it out there, and then it's done. It's something that's designed to be engaging um, so that, again, we are focusing on letting God into our budgeting conversations um, on a continuous basis. So I'll start with the first one, which might seem the simplest, but in my experience with a lot of our congregations, that is not so much the case. Sometimes this in and of itself is a conversation that may have needed to happen for quite a while now, years, maybe decades, I don't know, you know, but in a lot of cases where we walk into, you know, trying to help our congregations in, you know, uh, with vestry meetings or uh, finance committees with doing things like this, we come to understand that that, our, that mission has not really been well articulated for quite a while. And it's hard to have a mission-based budget if you don't know what your mission is. So um, that is definitely the first step. We started here in the Diocese of New Jersey with this missional focus on uh, being a discipling diocese. Our tagline for probably about three or four years now has been know your story, live it boldly. And as we've sort of, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, lived with and, you know, we've been abiding with this idea one of the things that came out of a uh, diocesan leadership um, uh, gathering last June um, was Bishop Stokes's statement, articulating his understanding of our mission. And he said, we have one purpose, to form people as disciples of Jesus Christ so that they can participate in God's mission of reconciliation in order to flourish as human beings committed to alleviating the world's pain and suffering. And so that was really a watershed moment, I think, for our diocesan leadership um, to have that articulation come out. We had, and I don't, when I say it was a watershed moment, I don't mean to say everything automatically fell in place and everything was wonderful and beautiful from there. What ensued was this incredible conversation around what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And how do we then empower our congregations you know, again, remembering we're looking at this from a diocesan standpoint, understanding that that mission needs to occur locally. Our role is to empower our congregations to do this, you know, so that our congregations can take a look at this purpose and say, okay, if we are, um, you know, ad adopting this, then what resources do we have in order to be able to do this? Because quite honestly, this is something that a lot of us haven't really talked about or done in a very, 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 very long time. Um, and so we did wrestle with this for a while, and then we came up with this concept of schools of discipleship um, as being, you know, our, over, our overriding mission. So we got to that point, and now we needed to choose a framework um, within which to evaluate how well are we doing in living into this mission that we've now adopted. And so we did have, we have for quite a while, as I mentioned before, um, evaluated our budget. I mean, even before we came up with that particular mission statement, we had already been evaluating our budget in terms of the five marks of mission um, as a way to articulate 
the things that we were doing, even before we, as, as I said, clarified, we had that idea, you know, about empowering our congregations, but just didn't have the statement. Um, now we have the statement. We, that just, that one of the things that really did just fall into place um, was the fact that we had been working with the five marks of mission. And that's a very natural way um, to express how are we doing with discipleship because the five marks of mission as listed here, um, which also um, correspond quite closely with the five, what they call lifestyle um, creeds in the baptismal covenant, um, really do a good job of help allowing us to evaluate these areas of discipleship and how we're supporting our congregations in living into them. So this was our framework, it was already there. So the next thing we needed to do was choose categories across each framework, across each uh, mark of mission that would help group our expenses um, into meaningful buckets um, that could be consistent across all the categories. Um, so you remember, again, we had our regular budget that had all those many, many, many line items. Um, there was six pages worth. You only saw the first one. Um, and then we had to decide within these things that we have here, what to, how does it make sense to group these things so that we can be consistent um, and concise across all five marks of mission? And so this was the, these were the groupings that we, uh, that we eventually came up with. There are 14 of them. Um, and it really kind of helped us, again, recognizing that this is not only going to be sort of a mission conversation document, but it's also going to be, um, needs to be meaningful for, for our diocesan council, our finance and budget group, our trustees, to be able to see meaningful groupings of the expenses that we have. Um, so we have our direct assistance to congregations, which is mission uh, assistance to um, a number of, of our mission congregations. Um, the bishop and I and our congregational support um, as we go uh, all over the diocese, really working with vestries um, and churches. Um, our communications staff and expenses, so that vital communications function. Um, critically important congregational development and Christian formation. Uh, transitions ministry, which, you know, at a diocesan level, that's a very significant uh, grouping to have because we do spend um, a lot of time and effort in consulting with congregations uh, as well as, um, uh, I mean, on transition, when they're in transitions, as well as just in general. Uh, youth and young adult ministry, staff and expenses, support of the Episcopal Church, um, clergy development and support, and you can read the rest of them. Um, so these were the ones that we decided were meaningful for us. Um, obviously, that's going to be different for each one of you um, as you look at your budget and you decide what a meaningful uh, category breakdown might look like. So then at the end of the day, uh, this is pretty much what we, this is the framework. So you can see as we're going through the marks of mission here, that within each one, all of the categories are the same. And this then provides that consistent matrix that we use um, across all of the different uh, uh, marks of mission to group our budget. So then we move on to allocating ministries. And you know, this is one of the places where I just want to really lift up the conversation. Um, there's obviously been conversation all along the way, and I hope that you're getting some kind of a feel for, uh, again, how vitally important that conversation is and all of the ways that God and the Holy Spirit will enter into your conversation uh, when you're working through this. Um, and then the way that I've seen, you know, our congregations latch onto this the most is when it comes to allocating ministries, because now you're getting down to what do we actually do? You know, um, and how does that fit into now we've we've talked about mission, we've chosen a framework, um, we've chosen categories, but in allocating the ministries now we're kind of going back into saying, well, okay, now here's what we do. Does that really fit into our framework? And does that actually accomplish the mission we said we wanted to be about? And so all of this becomes a part of this conversation. Um, and so uh, with, uh, when we did this conversation at the diocesan staff level, 
We did it with newsprint up on the wall. We had mark number one, mark number two, mark number three. We just did the newsprint up on the wall and we took more than one for each mark if we needed it. And we started talking about all of those things that you kind of saw in that one graphic for that one mark that we do and divided them up between the mark submission. Um, and then um, we started talking about um, you know, how involved we each in our own capacities are with these different mark submission as a way to begin allocating the costs, which comes next, but it all kind of wraps up in this, in this conversation. When I've had this conversation with congregations, and this is actually a little bit of a, you know, kind of an example of, of what one of the congregations did um, as they were having this conversation, they started going through and first they just marked with an X with all the different things that they were doing here you know, what belonged in which mark. And obviously, you know, there are many ministries that go across more than one, uh, maybe some that actually do all five. Um, and in that case, they started marking it in there how much of a percentage they thought belonged in each mark of mission. So that's where you see the numbers. So you can see it was as simple as just putting this, you know, this together on a spreadsheet and then just kind of going through and having the conversation. Um, vestry finance team, vestry and finance team together, however it works. You know, and this conversation, when, when I've been together with congregations doing it, typically starts off very slow. Um, I remember doing one where there was the newsprints up on the wall, and I gave everybody around the table markers. Um, so they could each get up and wander around and write what they felt like. And um, it, took, it seemed to take forever for the first person to get up from the table and she picked some real low hanging fruit. She went over to proclaim the good news and she said, well, you know, I guess maybe Sunday school belongs here. I was like, yeah, good, that's good. And she said, but wait, it, it's also teaching and baptizing. I said, yep, so write it over there too. And she went over and she wrote it. And then gradually more people got up and they started, and pretty soon everybody was up with their markers, wandering all over the room. Well, what about this? And what about that? And, you know, and then we added a little bit of a tag on the end. Well, what about the things that you're not doing that you would like to do? Where would they go? Um, and um, I told them at the end of it all that I wished that I had my recorder on my phone um, going during the time of the meeting, because even if you couldn't make out any of the words, you would have heard um, a decided uh, increase in the volume and the noise level in the room and the excitement. Um, just in, as part of doing this conversation. So here we are going back to these things that literally are talking about the, the mission and ministry that we're about. Um, and, um, and so it can be fun, I guess. That's what I'm kind of trying to say is that, you know, we're not used to, to budgeting being fun, but this is a very fun part of this whole process. So then um, we moved from allocating, now we have our ministries, we've got kind of a rough idea of you know, how much we think belongs in each, each mark of mission. Um, and then we also have our understanding of our, you know, we talked amongst our staff. I asked each one of our staff um, to go through and talk about um, or think about and send to me based on this allocation of these different ministries and our understanding of how we're spending our time in each one of those you know, uh, a thoughtful, I'm not going to ask anybody to be punching time cards or keeping track of this in ways that aren't sustainable, but just, you know, to give some thought, some real thought to how much time everybody spends in each one of these particular marks of mission. And that became, um, you know, our basis for allocating costs. So again, you know, it came to this particular, um, uh, to this particular end result. And I'm going to hope that I can get through this pretty well here. Yep. Internet connection looks like it's going to cooperate. Can you now see what I'm looking at? What yes. Thank you so much. For with this being our um, conventional budget, you know, so this is the part that I was talking about that just came straight off of our uh, financial uh, reporting system um, and, and exported into Excel format so we could work with it. This is the matrix that I was talking about where we just take all of the budget line items starting right from you know, the top to the bottom, just listed in numerical order with no breakdowns, um, but they are connected, they're linked to the numbers that are on this, um, mm -hmm. that are on this sheet, okay? And then the heading column C, which is the MBB grouping, is the one that, that is designating which of those categories that I mentioned earlier 
um, that this particular um, uh, line item falls into. And again, we have the 2018 totals that are coming in here for our full year budget, our year to date budget, um, and then the year to date actual, which literally comes off of this sheet. So it's actually linked. So as soon as we um, just do a different, uh, an import of the next month's sheet, this matrix updates um, automatically. It, we don't have to do anything, anything else to it. Um, and then again, here's mark number one, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom for line 10, which is our mission congregation, direct assistance to congregations allocation. We had 35% of that in mark number one. So it, it, it uh, prorates all of these numbers by the 35%. Um, and then again, you know, over uh, further, um, I don't know if I can move, but yeah, I guess I can move over that way. You can see, you know, all of the, the mark submission um, and the different allocations that they have for each line item. So that's where we got to that point. Um, and then based on these, uh, uh, these designations here, I literally just did a sort, you know, just a regular uh, sort um, on that data on column number, on column C, which brings me to this. So now I have all of everything that's the same in column C grouped together um, and totaled down here at the bottom, which then leads me to the final product. Um, and again, all of this is, all of these are linked. So that basic, that what happens is now, anytime I go to update this, these numbers off of my actuals, it, it goes all the way through, he, through to here. Everything carries through the calculations all the way through to here without me having to do anything uh, other than that. Or I shouldn't say me, it's actually Sarah Page, who's my controller who does this. Um, and so, um, you know, that's basically how we uh, would, would get to that point. So I am going to hop off here and I am going to hop back on to uh, this one. I'm, I, I just want to say, that's awesome. I was actually able to follow that and that was so much e more easily, you know, easy to read than the typical spreadsheet. So I, even that is awesome. Well mm -hmm. done. Well done, Phyllis. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm glad, I hope that the, you know, I know that I, I'm going through this really kind of quickly. And again, I just want to, you know, encourage anybody who wants to learn more to basically, um, you know, uh, to, to let me know. And as usual, when I'm coming back off of a different screen, this one doesn't seem to, there we go. Okay, so then finally we get to the developing the narrative, which again is the fun part. And we've kind of gone through, uh, you know, what that looks like based on the graphical representations. So there's our narrative for mark number one. Um, and then the, the numbers that go along with it, there's the narrative for mark number two. Um, and again, this is all Prezi stuff. Every single one of these presentations is a Prezi uh, theme. Uh, mark number two, mark number three, mark number four, and mark number five. And that got us through, um, through that, uh, you know, through to the end of it. And now we get to the point where we've got, you know, we're going back uh, again, after this has been done, this is a continuing conversation. Um, and part of what we also do is now with all of our committees, as a result of doing things this way, with all of our committees, commissions, or anyone who is requesting money from our budget, uh, we ask them to complete as a part of their request, please list the work of your organization department committee that is supported by the budget under the rele re relevant mark of mission. Um, if a mark is not relevant, indicated as not applicable, please provide examples and as much detail as possible. This is where I get the information that goes into my um, narrative. Because again, as a, as a diocese, I'm not always directly involved, you know, in what's going on. So for me to get a good picture and continually be able to tell the stories in their updated versions, I need this. So the results pretty much speak for themselves. Uh, do you want to talk from this all the time or would you rather talk from this? Um, and it just completely changes the conversation um, that people are having to the point where when we're leading with this part over here and we're talking with our diocesan council 
about these things that we're doing, many of which are already getting reported out at the meeting anyway. And then we're taking a look at how we're supporting that with our resources. We're not only looking at our financial resources, but we're also talking about all of the things that happen with structures and buildings and volunteers and everything else um, that goes along with what the money actually makes possible. Wow. <laughs> that was fantastic. So we do have a few comments and a, a couple questions. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a comment from our, our friend and colleague Demi in Texas. She says, uh, Phyllis and her controller and or her controller should do an Excel tutorial on this whole process. I love it! Exclamation point. <laughs> and she finally understands that percent refers to how much of the budget any given line item is allocated. Right. Yeah, right. that's great. Um, <clears throat> we had. I would be happy to do that at some point in the future. I think that would be a that could be a good follow on on to this one. For sure, I love it. Uh, we also have a question: What's the greatest challenge in helping the diet, like the diocese and or its congregations, to use and understand the shift from you know your conventional budgeting, ver you know, to your mission-based budgeting? Any hiccups well, along the way? Always, yes, there are. Um, I think that really um, focusing away from the conventional mindset, the scarcity, um, letting go of fear and anxiety long enough to allow for the chance that this process could actually work. Mm. Um, we had one of our congregations who was um, uh, experiencing a severe budget crunch. They were looking at trying to cut staff by about 20% in a very precipitous kind of a way that we were very concerned would, um, would really, you know, uh, run the risk of blowing apart the congregation. And so we employed um, a version of this to be able to first sit down and have them really realize that when they were talking about cutting staff, this was not just a money thing that was gonna to happen to them. This was gonna have an impact on the entire congregation that they really needed to discuss with the entire congregation before they just went ahead and did it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we used the mission-based budgeting as a way to do town halls with the congregation to get them to a point of understanding how this impacts the mission and ministry that was going on as a part of their you know, their, their decision-making process. They followed on to that with doing renewal works, which I thought was an excellent idea for them to get better grounded in where they were spiritually. And they may still come to a, a conclusion that they need to change something, but if they do, it will be after having gone through a clear understanding of what the impacts of that are likely to be. So getting us to understand ourselves as really powering our mission um, and, and letting that be the conversation long enough to have it take effect is the major hurdle we come across. Okay, great. Would you say that you've, you've been able to see any impact so far? Absolutely, yeah. Again, this one congregation that I just talked about, I think was one uh, we have had, we have used this you know, five marks of mission model uh, with a number of different congregations. We have a few congregations that are in the process of affiliation right now. So for them to be able to take a look at what are they doing in terms of the five marks of mission, um, and then if they're, you know, whatever other congregation they're affiliating with, have them do the same thing, and then look at them side by side and see where their, their, common, uh, you know, their common experience is and where they can actually, you know, look to build together. And also, at the same time, keeping in mind that for us anyway, an affiliation is um, one priest serving two different two congregations who are doing some things together, including sharing the priest, but are also they still retain their separate identities and their separate buildings. Yeah. Um, and uh, but you know by the uh, uh, since they often do things together, there is some kind of a melding that's going on there. So to go through this exercise with them is often very helpful um, in getting them to understand their own mission and ministry and what their joint mission and ministry might be. A little okay. Better. Well, we have time for one more question. I do have a comment. I, I think I like this a lot because no longer are we saying we have this much money. What are we going to do with it? We're also not saying we want to do this. How much money do we need? But it's really kind of a holistic approach. 
-hmm. to doing both simultaneously. And I feel like that is, it's just awesome. I'm really glad that we, we had you on to do this webinar. Final mm -hmm. question. What is your best tool in helping the finance types, quote, to shift to a more narrative conversation? Quite honestly, I think I would have to say it's the fact that we are not throwing away the conventional budget and we're providing a more rigorous transition um, from what the conventional budget looks like to what the mission-based budget looks like. So when, you know, the financial types can literally, they're the ones that actually you need to do this matrix, you know, to do the transition because they're the ones that know the spreadsheets in and out. And so a lot of times if you can engage them in being the ones that say, okay, you know, here's the information that we're getting in, how then do we translate this into a spreadsheet that can take us, you know, from here to here on a regular basis so that we can continue to have this conversation, they can be very helpful there. And it also helps with buy-in in the process. But, you know, it really is important to note, especially for those folks, we're not throwing the conventional budget out the window. You know, we're really going to have a parallel presentation, you know, and if you want to look back at that so that you can get the comfort level you need, that's great. But we're having this conversation. Great. Well, thank you so much, Phyllis. I, we're, our time is up. Do you want to go to the last, your last slide so folks can see your sure. contact information? Sure. Um, friends, there's also a number of different uh illustrations that Phyllis has in the remaining slides and they will be available to you uh, via our website which is ecfvp.org. You can also subscribe to our vital practices and receive vestry papers on a monthly basis in ECF News and um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your time. Do you have anything last, last comments or anything you'd like to share Phyllis? No, I just, you know, just want to uh, just, I guess the only thing that I would just say is I'm really excited um, about the, some of the responses that we've had to this approach. I'm excited to be working with Ken and Rob Drosty, um, who is our Canon for Mission and Discipleship, and being able to see how this completely can dovetail and support everything that he's doing um, in his efforts to, you know, again, lead people towards this direction of uh, seeing what God's up to out in the community and joining in with this. And just, it's such a, as you mentioned, such a, a comprehensive, holistic approach that we find ourselves in the same space, both Rob and I, even though we're coming at it from different approaches, we are literally in the same space. And I hope that the same uh, can be true for some of, some of the folks who might be with us today. Great. Well, thank you so much to my fellow Episcopals. Happy mission-based budgeting. <laughs> Cheers.